Welcome to Dentology, the Business of Dentistry podcast. In this podcast, we delve into the non-clinical aspects of dentistry with inspirational guests from across the profession. You will hear incredible life stories, pick up valuable business tips and be entertained. I'm Andy Acton and I'm joined by my co-host, Chris Drevens. So one of the most common questions we're asked is about EBITDA, uh. reconstituted net profit and what it all means. Because I think sometimes in our world, it's easy just to kind of ban these phrases around because we deal with it all the time. And I think it's probably worth just stripping it back to basics, explaining what EBITDA is, but importantly, what reconstituted net profit is. So, so EBITDA, let me, let me start with that and then I'll, I'll leave you okay, to cool. unravel reconstituted net profit. It's just a bunch of letters, but it's one of those interesting ones that, as you say, people sort of focus on it, but I'm not really too sure they understand what it is. No, so so EBITDA, um, the E is the earnings, um, which is the, the profitability that right, sits okay. down the bottom. Um, so that's the money that you've earned as a result of your business. It's interesting why they business. call it net, like an N. Yeah. But I suppose it would then be a nubida. It wouldn't work, would it? But no, no, it's interesting. Um, interesting. The B is probably the least important and interesting part of the mnemonic, which is before. <laughs> oh, okay, right. Yeah. <laughs> so then what you've got, you've got your earnings, and then what you're adding back to it. So the before bit is the I is interest. Okay. So any um, leasing interest, uh, bank interest, that all gets added back. Uh, the T is the tax. So if you've paid any tax that's due, uh, which should be due on your profitability. That so gets limited companies really back. only on that Corporation one. Corporation tax, yep. exactly. Um, because, yeah, because as an individual, you wouldn't have tax because you would take your drawing. So that would go on your personal tax return and you pay personal tax, income tax. Mm. So, yeah, the T is the tax. The D is depreciation. So that's the allowable accountancy deduction, which would typically be applied to your equipment, fixtures and fittings. Right. As a, as a typical deduction. Okay. And then the A is amortization, which is in the accountancy world, instead of calling it depreciation, they call it amortization, which effectively is the depreciation of the goodwill element. So you've got your earnings, profit, before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. And the idea is that that gives you um, a stable position to be able to compare business to business. And for lots of businesses, that does work. Um, Because dentistry is slightly different, and the slightly different bit is many of them are run not as lifestyle businesses, but there are benefits as a dental practice owner where you can incur costs that don't directly relate to the efficient running of a dental practice. And that's why we believe that the reconstituted net profit is really important because for an independent owner taking that practice over, that's a much more reliable number mm, it's more of, realistic, of, of, it? of what that profitability is in that business. So, yeah, so that's the EBITDA bit. So, so what's, what's reconstituted net profit? How does that differ? So uh, I think the way I've tried to explain it to some people is a bit like EBITDA on steroids. <laughs> yeah. um, because, as you say, the, the, most of our uh, businesses, one, that are still sole traders, so you can sort of discount the tax bit anyway. Yep. But the reality of what we want to do and what we've done is if a normal, if there's such thing as a normal dentist, was to take over this practice, mm. what would it look like? Mm. Because basically um, it's a bit like, I suppose, there's no point buying um, a two-seater MX-5 if you actually want a family saloon because mm. it's it's just not fit for purpose, yeah. is it? So if you've got someone who wants to buy a dental practice who is a general dentist, who wants to buy an implant practice, it's a four-door yeah. saloon instead of a, a Mazda. So, so what we try to do um, is effectively reconstitute <laughs> the profit for a – purpose buyer to fit that practice so um, you've got your EBITDA which uh, as we know is a start point but then we look at those other things so uh, what are the most obvious ones and feel free to chip in Um, the the most obvious ones I think are when you've got a principal who is working three days a week because they wanted to work three days a week yeah it's not that there's no business. It's just the fact they wanted to play golf. They wanted to stay at home. They wanted to sit and watch that's TV. One of, the, one of the choices as a business owner, yeah. you can do as much or as little as you want yeah. in you terms know, of hands on. They might have worked for 30 years or they might have worked for 10 years, but they only want to work three days a mm. week. So um, to provide the 
uh, cover to generate the other income, they employ an associate. So the, the most obvious one there is why, when you buy this practice, are you going to work three days a week? And uh, I think we can genuinely say from our experience, uh, most people want to buy a dental practice to work in it. Mm. Most of them will take a pretty chunky old loan on it. And most of them will want to uh, generate as much revenue as they can and remain sane mm. and not get divorced. And it might be that, that they go through that cycle of in the early days working perhaps four, four and a half, possibly even five clinical days a week. But they might become the dentist in 10 years' time that's doing three days a yeah, week. Yeah, exactly. So it's just where you are in your, yeah. your life stage. So, so what we did then do is we look at it and say, right, well, you're paying, you know, let's say you're paying £100,000 for an associate. So your profit has been reduced by 100000 mm. So, So just to keep it simple, let's say your, your profit was on your accounts £200,000. Yep. But you've paid a hundred thousand pounds to an associate because the associate is doing two days a week. So you would might come in and say, "Well, actually, I'm going to take over those two days a week." So are you going to have to pay that associate? No, no. So so therefore, so that hundred thousand pound can be added back. Yeah. Right. So your two hundred has become three hundred. So suddenly, it's way more profitable. So so that's an obvious one. Um, I think some of the others I've seen um, would be whereby um, the wife is the dentist, the husband is the, um, this is a podcast, so you can't really see me doing inverted commas, is the practice manager uh, who's on uh, £75,000 a year. Right. So the the reality of a uh, a sale is, one, would you keep <laughs> the husband of the, uh, selling dentist on as your practice manager and the answers uh, i don't think so it's um, unlikely uh, and if you wanted a practice manager would you pay them seventy five thousand pounds again uh, unlikely so, so that's so, an item that can be added back so, again so let's say 35 grand for a practice manager that's forty thousand pounds that you can add to your bottom line so so those are two rich so so if if that scenario was in that practice we've just added a hundred and forty thousand pounds profit um what other ones can you think of i've seen quite often courses and travel yes courses yeah, so definitely. you know very reasonably for um cpd reasons you know dentists do need to attend courses need to start to date with the profession the latest techniques however um you may or may not need to go to, on a course that's in Germany or Croatia or New York. Or, or in the case of the guy that I met whilst on holiday in Sun City, South Africa, where yeah. he was doing an implant course. Yeah. And I don't doubt, I'm sure these these courses are of very high quality, but from, from a running a dental practice point of view, that's kind of more um, personal development for you and doesn't necessarily warrant the, the, the investment of, of, of money mm. for that practice. Mm. And like with travel, again... People yeah. may travel travel's around. A, travel's a good one, yeah. To get to different to get to different events, um, and again, that's a, a cost that would have been incurred by the practice, which doesn't necessarily motor. I've seen motor expenses appearing in accounts um, before, and again, um, when you're only travelling to and from your place of work and it's your dental practice, arguably that's not something that that would feature for somebody mm. going forward. And I guess all these small items they add up, don't they? Yeah, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? I know we we quite often get questioned about the reconstituted profit number mm. and you know where did we where did we get it from and it, it's almost sometimes as if the the buyers think we just sort of like right we've taken a number we've made it up and then we just added it back to make it look better but i think we will say don't we ask us the question because we can tell you where those numbers mm. come from you know i think the other one that, we're, that we've seen as well is the the surplus calculation i know that sometimes people get a bit confused over that don't yeah. they so do you want to talk us through the surplus calculation? yeah so in essence and it's it's been really relevant in the past few years because of what's happened post-covid but the surplus calculation effectively factors in but by the very nature of financial accounts, they're historic. Mm. So at the moment, um, we're now in May 2023. Um, we're looking at accounts for 2022 at the latest. In some cases, 2021, if people are a bit behind their, um, their admin. So what it means is that the dental practice in the last 9, 12, 18 months, the numbers have changed. And where you see um, 
an increasing profile, uh, you know, uh, the fees are going yeah, up. Yeah, yeah. Um, with those fees going up, there will be an associated profitability. So what we do is we do a calculation that says, okay, so in your last set of accounts, you turned over £700,000, but your last 12 months figures show that you're producing revenue of £850,000. In that difference of £150,000, there's going to be a, a, a profit surplus. Mm. So we will do a calculation to establish what we believe that profit surplus to be after deducting labs, materials, associates costs, hygienists, whatever it might be. Um, we'll also look to make sure that the staff costs are similar to the last set of yeah. financial accounts yeah. to try and get, and it is, you know, it, it's an informed guess. Mm. It's, it's it's not a pure guess, but it is an informed guess. And what that will do is that will give us a surplus for the last 12 months mm. that, again, would add to the profitability. Because because accounts are always so far out of date, you're always working a year to 18 months behind. Mm. And mm. so one, because um, it, it can go one of two ways. Yeah, in a declining position, yeah, we want to make sure that down, yeah. exactly we want to make sure we can present the most current position possible. Um, the reality is that for most in the last two years, the numbers have gone up, and so quite rightly, the seller would expect to for that to be factored mm. into their valuation, but also the buyer is buying a business that's performing at a higher level than is shown on the accounts. Yeah, and I think it's reassuring for, for those listeners to understand that we're not trying to fleece them with a value because we don't just take the income and then say right we'll, we'll take your labs and mats so you made like an extra 100 grand profit mm. we do say well someone else is going to have to generate those numbers unless the principal's got the capacity which in most cases they don't yeah. so there's an associate cost and i think the one that they they probably don't know that we do because uh, be honest we probably don't articulate it in our in our calculation because we just show a number but the answer is ask us is the fact that we do look at the current staff hmm. as opposed to those historical staff yeah. especially in the current environment where it makes a difference doesn't it oh well if you think that it's it's been you know well covered in the press there's been strikes of people striking for more money lots of dental practices have increased the pay rates to their to mm. their team mm. And you're right, we get a schedule um, of up-to-date team members and what they're paid, and we then cross-reference that to the staff cost in the last set of accounts yeah. and look at what the difference is and factor that yeah. into the valuation. And and just to be clear, obviously, we're, we're directors of Frank Town Associates. What we're talking about applies to any valuation. You should be able to go to any organisation yes. that provide a valuation and, and ask questions like this to understand how that valuation has been created. Any decent valuer should be able to defend and explain yeah. how they got to their number. Yeah, it's not sort of like thinking my birthday times yeah. it by two and add 10% or something. Yeah. Uh, I, I must admit, I think the reconstituted profit figure is that one that uh, EBIT does great, and and obviously for um, for multiples, <laughs> mm. they uh, you know as in sorry associate led buyers, they will uh, probably use EBIT DAR more than our reconstituted profit figure. Yeah, um, but the the two apply. I tell you one thing that that might be worthwhile. Uh, you mentioned Andy because we get it all the time. Is the difference between uh, when people are down the pub or in the cafe or at a dental show, probably more appropriately, where you've got some guy saying, I sold for eight times EBITDA, and another bloke says, well, I sold for five times EBITDA. But they're sort of almost the same practices in the same locality. Mm. Uh, and, and, and somehow the bloke or, or the pair change, the bloke who sold for five feels that he's been hard done by. Yeah. So I, I know that we've, we've had this discussion with loads of people, but it might be worthwhile you explaining that as to, to why that sort of looks a bit odd. So let's just try and keep the, the numbers really simple. So we have a dental practice that produces a profit of £200,000. Cool. Yeah. And that's the, the profit is with the principal working in the business. Right, okay. So that business um, would attract a multiple of five times. Okay. Profit of 200, multiple of five is worth a million pounds. million pounds. That's with a dentist working in, in that practice. So it's your owner, manager. Exactly. exactly. Most of the practices still owner, manager, yeah. million pounds. Yeah. Okay. So the, these numbers don't quite work, but, but it will just make the point. If that same practice was being run on an associate-led model, so okay. it's owned by a corporate, right. they're completely reliant on associates to deliver the, the dentistry. 
Mm-hmm. Let's just say that profitability dropped to one hundred thousand pounds. Yep. So there's no longer two hundred thousand pounds. It's one hundred thousand okay. pounds because you're paying everyone to deliver the because work. Because yep. they increased associate costs, um, and that practice is now going to have a multiple of ten times. So the other one only had a multiple of five times, and now you're getting a ten times multiple, which is which amazing is, news. Right, which is high. It's, it's brilliant. <laughs> it, it is high, and it's amazing. Um, ten times a hundred thousand is a million pounds. So same value. So a two hundred thousand pounds profit with a five times multiple is a million pounds, and a ten times multiple, but it's only applied to a hundred thousand profit, is a million pounds. Still a million. Pounds. So the value doesn't change, and it's important to to mentioned that in evaluation there's two numbers that are really important everybody obsesses about the multiple when you're down the pub everyone says oh what a multiple yeah, is that? What a multiple that is, is that? Yeah. and a multiple um by virtue of of the word multiple has to be multiplied by something mm. the something it's multiplied by is critical because that's the underlying profitability and as that moves your value moves and if a practice is going to be worth the same regardless of who buys that practice the profit changes, so the multiple changes. Mm. So a multiple is a really interesting number only in the context of what's it being multiplied by. A multiple, a multiple on its own is meaningless. Yeah, There's no context. There's no context. It's because, it's, isn't it, it's the, you know, we, we've done this for a very long time, and I think, you know, Frank and Sandra, what is it, longest, oldest, well-established, whatever, mm. 1988, you know, that when we first bought the business in 2000, the question we were always asked was, what's the percentage? What's the percentage of yeah. turnover goodwill? What's the percentage? That was it. That's what people ask. Now they say, what's the multiple? But the principle is still the same. You know, what percentage? Well, what you multiply, what you yeah, apply yeah, the percentage yeah. to, the multiple, well, what are you applying it to? And if you don't go to the second question, which is, well, what's it multiplied yeah. by? The multiple means nothing. Yeah. From a vanity point of view, you know, I've got 10 times. Yeah, it yeah, sounds yeah. brilliant. Whoop, whoop. But you might be better only getting a lower multiple because it's been applied to a higher profit. This yeah. is all about delivering pound notes into the bank account. Mm. It's not It's not an ego or a vanity yeah. game. It's about getting a, a robust valuation that, that stands up, but the underlying profitability mm. is applied to a, a multiple that, that, that works. Mm. And, and uh, what I, th- I suppose what we can say in closing is when we look at trying to do the reconstituted profit, we try to do it as a as a general dentist taking over. So people who yes. are uh, undergrossing but have the potential, as in someone else is grossing, that will be factored in. But also it, when someone's a super grosser, that has to be factored in as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the idea is that as valuers, as every value, as Andy says, as you said, man, is the fact of it should be what's going on. You know, what's yes. the what's the repeatability? Yeah. Not necessarily what it is now. Absolutely. Oh, good. We enjoyed that. Excellent. Really Hope good. people get it. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this episode of Dentology, where we discuss the business of dentistry. If you like what you heard, please do subscribe where you found this episode. That would be amazing. And also follow us on Instagram.